So welcome everybody. Today we will continue our study of Mor Nebuchim. We are at lecture number 79. It's really, really hard to believe that we've stuck it out this long together and hopefully we'll keep going until the end. We are about to study chapter 31 in part two of the Mor Nebuchim, uh, which is on page 359 of the Pines edition, book two of that edition. And for those... Uh, that studied with us last week, we remember Rambam spent a long chapter 30, which took us two weeks to get through, um, describing how to interpret the book of Genesis, how to interpret Bereshis. Um So that was, uh, that was the, um, uh, the topic of before. So kind of leading into the topic he's going to discuss in chapter 31, it's a little bit bouncing around, but not so much, because when he talks about creation, the next thing he's going to talk about very briefly, but in a nice way, is Shabbat, is the Sabbath, is Shabbos. So, um, the the um, so a nice little uh, the, today it's going to be a little less uh, of this deep philosophical stuff debating Aristotle, and then a little bit more of um, of just some some nice thoughts. So, so let's see what he has to say about Shabbat, chapter thirty-one, perhaps. It has already become clear to you what is the cause of the laws establishing the Shabbos so firmly and ordaining death by stoning for breaking it. Why is Shabbos such a serious and such a big deal? The master of the prophets, meaning Moshe, has put people to death because of it. In the famous story of the Mekoshes, the gatherer of wood, the first person who blatantly and publicly violated the Sabbath right after it was given in the wilderness. Um so it was a serious deal, and it comes third after the existence of God, right? Anochi, the first of the Ten Commandments, and the denial of dualism, lo yilacha, there shouldn't be any other gods before you. So those seem pretty big. The next thing up to bat is Shabbos, is, 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 is the Sabbath. So um, perhaps you already know why it's so important. For the prohibition of the worship of anything except him only aims at the affirmation of the belief in his unity. So they're really the same one. The first two are really just kind of correlation of, uh, you know, uh, are, are flip sides of, of the same idea that there's one God and there is no other gods. So the next thing is Shabbos, is the Sabbath. So you know from what I have said that opinions do not last unless they are accompanied by actions that strengthen them, make them generally known and perpetuate them among the multitude. So there's an idea. So Ramam is trying to say that Shabbos is the primary uh action that we do to um to uh make that idea that i just told you of the one god and the creator of the universe something real right so you can teach people ideas but as long as they remain highfalutin ideas that float around in the classroom they don't mean much to people so in judaism in particular emphasizes this idea over and over again the ramam is going to say this that you know, we don't just celebrate Pesach, you know, Passover by saying, no, freedom is a good thing. We make a ritual. We do a thing in order to bring that idea and make it real, make it something we experience. So Shabbos is the way, and excuse me, I'm going to use the Shabbos, my traditional way, Ashkenazi way of pronouncing it. But for those that want to call it Sabbath or Shabbat, just know what I'm talking about. Shabbos is the way where we make this great, great idea that we've been talking all this time about, we make it real. We bring it into our lives. And there's three things here. Number one, they strengthen the idea in our minds. So we think about it more because of it. Number two, we make it known, right? The idea. And we perpetuate it among the multitude, meaning among those who, are, who didn't think about these philosophical grand ideas. This is the general public. But we bring it back. We bring this idea to them. By, by keeping Shabbos and making it something that we all do together. For this reason, we are ordered by the law, by the Torah, to exalt this day in order that the principle of the creation of the world in time be established in university known in the world. So we do this in, 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 so that the idea that the world was created, right, should be something that everyone knows through the fact that all people refrain from working on one and the same day. Everyone stops working the same day. Not just you decide when you're tired and need a day to chill, that you chill, and then my, maybe I can work another couple of days until I take a day, day off. Not that, like that. But we all do it on the same day. So if it is asked, what is the cause? Of, why is everybody stopping work today? The answer is, for in six days, the Kishet says, Yom HaMasa, Shem HaShemayim It was six days God took to create the world. So 
Now, Rambam is going to point out, though, that in the Torah we find two reasons for Shabbos. One was what he just said, and the other we'll bring in a minute. For this commandment, two different causes are given, corresponding to two different effects, right? Each one of these causes, of, in other words, reasons for, the, for keeping Shabbos, each one brings about a different idea. In the first Decalogue, right, in the first uh, round of, of the Aserah Sadebros, the one that's in Parshat Yisro in Exodus, right, the cause for exalting the Shabbos is stated as follows. For in six days the Lord had made and so on, right? However, in Devarim, in Deuteronomy, on the other hand, it said, and thou shalt remember that thou wast a slave in Egypt, and therefore God commanded you to keep Shabbos. So we have two reasons here, and they seem very different one from the other, right? One is talking about... Um, uh, the idea that Shabbos, which Ramam said in the first paragraph, the idea that Shabbos, we keep it in order to um, to remind us and remind the world and, and proclaim this idea that the world was created. And the second was this idea that, 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 that we were slaves in Egypt and we earned our freedom. And this is correct. Why? For the effect, of, they're both important for, to bring out this purpose. And why is that? According to the first statement, is to regard that day as noble and as exalted. As it said, because God has blessed Shabbos day and made it holy, right? I just turned the page to 360 at the top. This is the effect consequent upon the cause stated in the words for in six days and so on. Why is this day holy? This day is holy because it conveys this very important idea of creation and, and a creator. However, the order given us by, by the Torah to re, with regard to it, and the commandment ordaining us to keep it are an effect consequent upon the cause that we had been slaves in Egypt, right? The reason why this is important is because of the lesson that we learn from the fact that we were once slaves in Egypt, where there we did not work according to our free choice and when we wished, and where we had not the power to refrain from working. We didn't have the choice in Egypt to decide whether or not we could or should work or when we can or can't rest. Right? It wasn't a choice that we had. So if, if someone happened to be resting while they were a slave, which is probably a very rare phenomenon, that resting was simply because they were able to, but not because they chose to do so, because they didn't have the free will to choose to do so. So therefore, we have been the, per, the, the, it's only because we were freed from Egypt and we were given the ability to choose, right? that gave the mitzvah, that gave the commandment of Shabbos any meaning. It's only a person who's free to choose when to work and when to rest. When such people decide, now is a day that I'm going to rest, right? And I'm going to deliberately rest, right? That's when the, there's meaning behind that rest. And we can say, why are we resting? We are resting because we want to demonstrate this idea and teach the world this idea that there is a creator. So, so it's it, it it's it's therefore we have been commanded in activity and rest so we can conjoin the two things: the belief in the true opinion, the idea, namely the creation of the world in time, that there was a moment of creation, which at the first go and with the slightest of speculation shows that the deity exists. Right? If there was a creation, then there is a God who made the creation. Right? Some some thing, some entity made it happen, and that would would be what we call a God. And the memory of the benefit God bestowed upon us by giving us rest from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Accordingly, the Shabbos is of universal benefit, right? Both with reference to a true speculative opinion and to the well-being of the state of the body. It's coming to tell you, right, that there's only meaning to what we do when we choose to do so and when we have the freedom to choose to do so, which is of universal benefit because all human beings, right, can give meaning to everything that we do. This is a a tremendous idea. What we all, we, our, our actions only have meaning when we can choose to do them, right? And when we're forced to do actions, then they don't have any meaning. Uh, and this is, a, you know, obviously an idea that goes way beyond Shabbos and an idea that goes way beyond, like Ramam says, a universal benefit, way beyond the specific mission of the Jewish people or whatever. <clears throat> that, that, that freedom, freedom to choose our actions gives meaning to our actions. Very important point, and this would be um, why the Torah gives both of these reasons for Shabbos. So, so, so if we if we extend this idea, you know, what what Ramam really just did was um, was uh, for really the first time in the book until this point, right? 
was to um to take us down from this world this lofty world of philosophy right and bring us down into the very very real world of work and rest and and the meaning behind our actions um and i think that and and the fact and the rama was telling us that this was the very idea why shabbos was the first thing commanded after telling us the two uh, lofty notions, the philosophical ideas about the existence of a creator, right? I, I could, I, this existence of a creator, Shabbos, right? Right? Because Shabbos shows us how to bring all of this, this philosophical idea and make it real. Um, that, that concludes this uh, short, but really, really beautiful chapter. Um, if anyone has any comments or questions, this would be a good time. I'll open the floor. Nobody? <laughs> All right. Well, feel free to interrupt me if you want to later. Um, I, as you all know, I don't have any problem with that. The, um, uh, the next chapter we're going to go on to, um, I, 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 everyone is muted, but you can feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask anything. The next chapter, 32, he starts to discuss the, quest, the subject of prophecy. But but he's he's not yet going to get to how prophecy works. Um, but he's gonna it's we're gonna get there in, in chapter 36. He's gonna get into it in more detail. But so prophecy. But he's gonna start discussing prophecy in a little more detail. So we're gonna get a little bit closer towards learning this extremely important subject of prophecy, which is obviously a very basic subject. Anyone that reads and believes and, and, and the Torah and, and believes in the Torah has to come to grips with the understanding that prophecy is some form of communication between the divine and a human being. How does this work? What does it happen? Who can be a prophet? Who can't be a prophet? Who decides whether or not they see prophecy? Is it the, the, like this, 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 these are the very basic questions about prophecy and Nebuah, which, which, um, which Ramam is going to begin discussing in this chapter. And, uh, and like I said, I promise you, he's going to devote a lot of time to this. Um, and, 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 and so we're, we're going to start forming those ideas in our, in our mind. We're going to start learning now what, 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 what prophecy is and what it isn't. So the first thing, as Rambam often did, did in many of the other subjects, is he, he deals with the, the, what he's arguing against, right? So he says their opinions of people concerning prophecy are similar to the opinions concerning the eternity of the world or its creation in time. If you remember, when Rambam talked about the eternity of the world or in creation, he brought four opinions, right? He brought the opinion of Epicurus, right? Which is that it's all a bunch of baloney. The gods, if they even exist, don't really care what's going on. There probably even isn't a god, which Rambam said, I'm not even going to deal with that, right? So chuck that one, right? But but because 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 philosophically and that not even going to deal with it. Un Nowadays, if Ramam would be writing this book, I'm sure he would have spent a lot more time with Epicurus. But those days, the philosophical world had thrown that idea out. But then he dealt with three main ones, right? The idea of Aristotle that it had always existed, right? The idea of Plato that that there was some primordial matter that was a mess that God then fashioned and made order out of it, right? And the idea of Rambam, which is the idea that the Rambam is telling us is the Torah, that the world was created, yes, may I, and something from nothing by a creator. So he's going to do a similar thing now, and he's going to bring several different opinions. So I mean by this, right, that um, what do I mean that it's similar? That just as the people to whose mind the existence of the deity is firmly established, as we have set forth, had three opinions concerning the eternity of world is creation in time, right? So are there also three opinions concerning prophecy? There's also three opinions concerning how prophecy works, right? So just like I told you there, there was Aristotle who believed in a God, right? However, he felt that, you know, um, the world always was and always will be and always has been exactly the same, right? There was the Plato uh, and so, and then there was us. Right. The same thing here. I shall also. And there he chucked the opinion of Epicurus in the garbage can. So I shall not pay attention to the opinion of Epicurus. I'm not even counting him as a fourth opinion. Right. Because he doesn't believe it. In other words, I'm not going to deal with those who say that prophecy doesn't exist at all. Right. That's why I argue that Ramam said this then because Epicurus's philosophy in those days was considered was considered wrong. Nowadays, a lot of people would 
would deny prophecy altogether. If Ramam was writing the book today, obviously, you know, I know if Ramam was alive today is one of those things that I promised I'd never do, but I'm doing it anyway. I'm sure he would deal with it a little more seriously. But I'm not going to deal with it for he doesn't believe in the existence of God. It's not 100% true. Epicurus, I'm not super familiar with Greek philosophy, but from the little bits and pieces that I've read, uh, it seems like Epicurus, he didn't really care. There Maybe there were gods, but or maybe there isn't God. But if there is or if there are, they, they don't really care about what's going on and they don't have anything to do with us. So it doesn't really matter. So he doesn't believe in, all the more he doesn't believe in prophecy. So I only aim to set forth the opinions of those who believe in the deity. So I'm going to deal with people who believe in God. Okay. So now I believe in God. Does God communicate with, with us on, in this world? How does he communicate with us? So, so there's three opinions. The first opinion, that of the multitude of those among the pagans, right? The, so these are the pagans. These are people who are not monotheists, right? They don't believe in a, a specific act of creation necessarily by a creator, although they might have some kind of creation myth, you know, of, of this God fighting with that God and somehow the world coming about to be or whatever, Right. But they considered prophecy as true, right? These pagans, they have prophets. They have prophets who speak godly things, right? And they say all kinds of stuff, right? So, and it's similar opinion is also believed by, by common people professing our Torah, right? That, that, um, that, that is that God may he be exalted. In other words, there's people that, in, that read the Torah that, believe, that say they believe in Torah, at least that also have a very similar belief system. And that is as follows. That God chooses whom he wishes from among men, turns him into a prophet, and sends him with a mission. So God decides, I'm going to make John Doe. He's going to be a prophet, and I'm going to give him a message, and I'm going to tell him, go tell these people the message. Right? God is going to find this guy named Jonah and say, Jonah, go to the Assyrians and say your prophecy. Right? That he was just picked out of the hat for whatever reason, we'll never know. Right? Uh, he wishes, uh, according to them, it makes no difference whether this individual is a man of knowledge or ignorant, aged or young. So these kind of people, if you think about it, Ram is saying, are the people who, who can imagine themselves to be prophets. Like right? They're walking around thinking, oh, now I got word from God. And they go say all kinds of things, right? Or they, they hope, oh, God, talk to me, talk to me. That's not how it works. Right? But that's how these people think it works, right? You can see the danger in that, right? So, however, they also, so they say, well, he has to have some kind of goodness and sound morality. So for up to now, people have gone so far as to say that God sometimes turns a wicked man into a prophet, right? I have not gone so far as to say that God sometimes, so they'll say, well, and what if the guy is, is what if you're terrible, right? What if you, you're just a miserable person? You're a thief, you're a liar, you're a cheat or whatever. But God's going to go and say, well, I, I, God will turn him into a good man. And then makes him a prophet. I want to say Rav Kapach in the Hebrew, and I, I always quote from Rav Kapach's, um, uh, you know, commentary. He he describes this. Remember, we're talking about pagans, right? Pagans. So that they'll believe. So there's no. So God can take a guy who's no good and say, okay, now you're a good guy, and I'm going to make you a prophet. Because remember, there's no in, in issue of bechira. There's no issue of free choice to these people. So 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 this this is belief number one. So if you um. If you ascribe to this belief, then a prophet becomes a prophet because God chooses him. And if and yeah, you have to be a good person. And what if he's not a good person? Well, God makes him a good person. You just come up with some explanation as to why this guy is saying prophecy. Okay. You, you could try to carry this idea and, and imagine what kind of people you'd believe are prophets if you take this uh, on its face value. And you could see how that could lead to danger. And you could see how a person today, and unfortunately this happens very frequently today, where a person of extremely suspect of character decides he or she, in some cases, is a prophet and could lead people in extremely bad directions. But that's path number one. Path number two. The second opinion is that of the philosophers. They have a much, a much more um, uh, uh, sophisticated opinion of how this prophecy works, right? So um, it affirms that prophecy is a certain perfection in the nature of man, right? You have to achieve pro prophecy is something you have to have the qualities that make it necessary that, that for you to, to, to see and hear and feel the wisdom of, of the divine, right? So, so this perfection is not achieved in any individual from among men, 
except after a training that makes that which exists in the potentiality of the species pass into actuality. In other words, a person is born with a with a fine head, with a good intellect, and then he's raised. He, I'm saying he because that's the world they lived in is mostly he, right? Uh, was given a great education and 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 he worked to learn and study and and so on. Um, uh, and and, and uh, provided an obstacle due to temperament, like if you're lazy, you know, you're not going to get there. Even if you have a good brain, if you're lazy, you won't get there. If you're dishonest, you won't get there, right? But if you're honest and you're able to to uh, to study for real and you and you work hard, or to some external causes, and it could also be hindered by external causes. You could be born with a great brain, but you could be born uh, to somebody who doesn't give you any education and under some circumstance where it's never realized as is the case with regard to every perfection whose existence is possible in a certain species, right? A person could be, wrong, be ra- born with the potential to be uh, a, the, the, a great skier, but if he's born in, uh, in, in Zambia, he's probably not going to know how to ski because it's hot there. I don't know. Maybe I got it wrong. There might be mountains. No, someone can, can correct me. But the point being that if certain things could stop you from being it, but it's a potential that has to be built. It has to be developed. For the existence of that perfection in its extreme and ultimate form in every individual, that species is not possible. <laughs> so if it can't be that every human being is capable of achieving that level, but certain people have it. And if every, even among all those people that have that potentiality, not every single one will achieve that potential. It must, however, exist necessarily in at least one particular individual. If in order to be achieved, this perfection requires something that actualizes it, so that something necessarily exists, right? So it has to be in a, so prophecy would therefore have to be something that exists in at least somebody, right? And that that somebody can actualize that potential. Now, here's the thing. According to this opinion, it's not possible that an ignoramus should turn into a prophet, nor can a man not be a prophet on a certain evening and be a prophet on the following morning, right? A guy can't one day be walking around and hears God speaking to him, and the next day he doesn't, according to this opinion, right? Because if he's perfect, then he's always able to tap into that, that, that prophetic wisdom. Things are rather as follows, according to this opinion. When in the case of a superior individual, this kind of person who is perfect with respect to his rational and moral qualities, his imaginative faculty, right? We already mentioned this a few times. But remember, Rambam has the uh, cognitive and imaginative faculty are two different things. Cognitive faculty is for somebody to understand specific things like facts and figures. Uh, mathematics or be able to describe what he or she is seeing. The imaginative faculty is the ability to to take that and create images and ideas and and thoughts and so on. So a person whose imaginative faculty is in its most perfect state, a prophet is someone, and we're going to get to this in more detail later, but a prophet is someone who can marry those two in his or her mind, who can take the the concrete ideas that he or she sees in this world and, and come and, and conclude from that the, a, a higher level of, of wisdom that's expressed in, in po- 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 poetry and in, in, in music and, and in ideas that can be conveyed to other people to arouse them, okay? So this person, his imagined faculty is in his perfect state, and when he's prepared in the way that you will hear, he will necessarily become a prophet. In other words, I'm going to explain to you later what kind of preparation such a person needs. But that person will, and this is the key point in this second version, will necessarily become a prophet. That person absolutely will, right? In as much as this is a perfection that belongs to us by nature. Because, because it's it's like a scientific fact, right? A person has the ability to, to tap into that wisdom. And if he goes through steps A, B, C, D, and E, he will get to step F, which is prophecy. According to this opinion, it's not possible that an individual should be fit for prophecy and prepared and not become a prophet, except to the extent to which it is possible that an individual having a healthy temperament should be nourished with excellent food without sound blood and similar things being generated from that food. In other words, um, the, scientist, the scientific fact is that if you eat a, these foods, you'll get these nutrients, right? Um, and, and, and so the same thing will happen. If you do these actions, you will be a prophet. In other words, and Rav Kapach points this out in his commentary, according to this opinion, God can't stop it, right? Because it's it's a it's a natural scientific fact that happens. So we have um, so now what 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 this then means is that you could think about some potential dangers that can come from this approach too, right? A person who we know to be uh, um, a, a very uh, a person who we, we know to have 
went through a process in his or her life and and has achieved a tremendous level of wisdom is not necessarily always speaking in the name of God, right? Sometimes they could even be speaking bad things, right? But according to this idea, everything they say is true. And the Rambam is telling us we, get, we, we, we should be careful of such an idea. So the third opinion then is the opinion of our Torah and the foundation of our doctrine. This is the foundation of what we believe. And what is that? It is identical with the philosophical opinion except in one key point, in one thing. I'm at the bottom chapter, pa paragraph, I'm sorry, on page 361. So we agree with the philosophers that the person has to have the, the, the qualities necessary, right? He or she has to, has to be, you know, educate themselves in both moral and intellectual and imaginative capabilities to bring him or herself to that level, right? But we believe that it, one step different, that it may happen that one who is fit for prophecy and prepared should not become a prophet, namely on the count of the divine will. Just because you went through the process doesn't necessarily mean that you will always gain prophecy, right? To my mind, this is like all the miracles and takes the same course as they. You have to understand there's a fundamental thing here. What that means is, is that it's not, it's not a natural scientific phenomenon because if it was, right, then, 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 then we you should be able to achieve it if you follow the rules, right? A chemical formula, if you you know if you put hydrogen and oxygen together, you get water. It's going to happen no matter what you do. If you put the energy in and out the right way, you'll get the result every time because that's the scientific law, right? But if you but prophecy doesn't work that way. You can put in you can put in A B C D E, but still not get the step F, right? Because because prophecy requires uh, uh, something from above, right? For it is a, um, just like all the miracles look, we discussed last week. We talked about, or was it two weeks ago, where Ramam discussed miracles, right? Where, where, where God, remember, a miracle is God set in the nature of the world that the divine um, influence or the divine speech in this case of Navua, the word Navua means nun bet yud is the shorish of. Uh, is is it's to speak right so um so that divine speech comes to someone only under circumstances where god wants it to happen for it is a natural thing that everyone who according to his natural disposition is fit for prophecy and who has been trained in his education and study should become a prophet right but it, it, he really should the person has everything necessary however he was prevented it's like him who has been prevented, like Yeravam, from moving his hand. In the case of Yeravam, where the prophet came to warn him not to set up his temple to, with the golden calf, <clears throat> Jeroboam, who's the first king of the of the northern uh, uh, kingdom of Israel. So Yeravam uh, tried to lift his hand. He couldn't lift his hand. So naturally, if a person decides to lift his hand, his hand should go up. But Yeravam wasn't able to do that. Or like the king of Aram's army going to seek out Elisha from seeing, where Elisha asked God to strike him with, with blindness that so he couldn't see um, where he was going so Elisha could lead him in the wrong direction to, and so on. But the point being that, that all rules would say that if the eyes look that way and there's something there, they should see it. But God, So, so um, the person who has achieved that level should have prophecy, right? Because it's in the very nature of the world that prophecy should occur. So he agrees with the philosophers with the sense that it is a scientific phenomenon in the sense that a person can prepare him or herself to be on that level, right? However, um, it doesn't always happen, right? Because sometimes, just like Yeravim couldn't lift his hand, this prophet doesn't get a message from God. Some messages, uh, some just aren't being communicated to that person. As for its being fundamental with us that the prophet must possess preparation and perfection and moral and rational qualities, uh, the, uh, not, he's going to go back for a second and you'll see what, what, what he does, right? But don't get me wrong. He absolutely has to go through that process. And if you don't believe me, uh, we, it says prophecy only rests upon a wise, strong, and rich man. You know, so that's the uh, Gemara in, in Masechus Shabbos. And we have explained this in our commentary on the Mishnah and our great compilation, which is how Ramam refers to his Mishnah Torah, right? And we have set forth that the disciples of the prophets were always engaged in preparation. When it talks in Navi about the Bnei Hanaviim, 
because these were people who were constantly engaged in preparing themselves to be ready for prophecy. So they were studying, they were perfecting themselves as human beings and so on in order that they could be ready for prophecy. As for the fact that one who prepares is sometimes prevented from becoming a prophet, you may know it from the history of Baruch ben Neiria, right? Who was a student of Yirmiyahu and if you... um of Jeremiah. So if you look at Yirmiyahu chapter 45, right? Um, uh, so so Yirmiyahu tells Baruch, right? right? You are searching out great things and all of the commentaries understand those great things are you are searching out this great knowledge. Don't stop searching them out. Because I am going to bring evil. In other words, I'm going to bring the destruction of Jerusalem. You're looking for some kind of prophecy, but God is not in the mood. This is, you know, obviously, I'm paraphrasing Jeremiah here, right? God is not in the mood of giving you prophecy right now. He's, uh, this is no good what's going on. So just stop looking for it. You're not getting prophecy now, right? So in a very, very similar point, right, where the book of... Um, uh, uh, so he, because because he followed your Miao Baruch did. He trained, taught, prepared him. He set himself the goal, but he was prevented, as it says. Um, um, uh, uh, I am uh, weary with my groaning, and I find the rest. Let me read that inside. Forty-five-three. Give me a second. Um, uh, right, right. I am exhausted. I am exhausted. Right. Uh, with my sighing, I don't find rest, right? Because I'm trying and I'm trying and I'm trying. I'm trying, right? Um, uh, to to um, to uh, to to achieve this level. I'm trying so hard to achieve this level, but I'm not getting anywhere. I'm exhausted, right? So that's that's um, that's uh, 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 thereupon he was told through Yimio, thou shalt say unto him, thus saith the Lord, and so on. And I'll see, you know, we just read that. Okay, it is possible. To say this is a clear statement that prophecy is too great a thing for Baruch. You might think that what this means is that prophecy is above him because it uses the language gedolos. You think you're seeking something that's greater than you, right? Um, you know, uh, because it, it's greater than you because all of the work that you do isn't necessarily enough to achieve that prophecy. God has to decide to do it. And if God is now not giving out prophecies, right, then it's not going to happen. Similarly, it may be said, as we shall explain, and this is fascinating because this is, it, Ramam is bringing this, this really beautiful in a, in a sad, tragic way, right? That at this time, this time of destruction of Jerusalem, right? Yirmiyahu, who is the author of the book of Eicha, the book of Lamentations, right? We have in Lamentations uh, uh, chapter two, it's a, a tragic, difficult verse that you may recall from Tisha B'Av, right? Tavu uh, v'aret the, the the gates of, the land of Israel have been destroyed of, of Jerusalem. The vaults that held its doors have, have been ruined and broken. Malka Visoreha, her king and her officers, Vagoyim, have been scattered among the nations. Ain Torah, the Torah is no longer here. Gam Nevi'eha, also her prophets, Lo Matsu Chazon Me'adonai. They did not find any vision, any, any, any prophecy from God. So this is part of the, the lamentation saying that that we've reached this point where where the prophets are there. The prophets and the work that the prophets have done is the same, but they're not getting vision from God because God's not giving out visions right now. It's very similar to the verse that we just read about regarding Baruch, the, the, the student of, of Yirmiyahu. However, so 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 we do agree with the with the philosophers about with the work that needs to be done, but we disagree in the fact that not everyone, just because somebody has achieved a great level, doesn't mean that he or she is a prophet. That is decided by God alone. However, we shall find many texts, some of them scriptural and some of them in the in the book, in the, in the, in the Chazal, all of which maintain this fundamental principle that God terms whom he wills, whenever he wills it, into a prophet, right? But only someone perfect and superior to the utmost degree, Right? So, so it is true that God decides who's a prophet, but he's only going to make that decision regarding someone who is, um, who is, is worthy, right? Who, ha, who has done that preparation. Um, but with regard to one of the ignorant among the common people, this is not possible, according to us. I mean, that he should turn one of them into a prophet. 
except that it is possible that he should turn an ass or a frog into a prophet, right? God cannot, and this is this is a matter of contention. The Ramban and some others point out, well, what about you know they talk about what about Bilam or you know or so on. Uh, asking about well, how what about Bilam's donkey? The Ramban would have understood the Bilam's donkey as not uh, as, as, as 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 not as a prophecy, but that we can leave that aside. But in other words, Ramban here is saying that God can't make a can't. I shouldn't say that. He could do what he wants, but he doesn't make a, a donkey or a frog into a prophet. He's also not going to make an ignoramus, right? So if there's an ignoramus walking around saying things in the name of God, that's ridiculous. He's not a prophet. Don't bother listening, right? It is our fundamental principle that there must be training and perfection whereupon the possibility arises to which the power of the deity becomes a chat. A person has to be at the level where the divine can attach to him, and then when God decides to give him a message, you can get that message. Remember, I told you the mechanics of how prophecy is going to work. The Rama is going to deal with later. Today, he's laying down certain rules that we need to know. And then he's going to go off on a few more tangents the next few chapters. But he's going to get back to prophecy. Right. But this is important. Now, what about the places where it seems that it doesn't require work? So one of the most famous verses he's about to bring. I'll read it from Yirmiyahu. Is a beautiful, beautiful in the beginning of Jeremiah. Right. Uh, the chapter one, God says to him, right? Um, uh, uh, it's right in the beginning. Um, this is verse four. The word of God to me was as follows. This is Yermio talking about his 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 call to prophecy, the beginning of Yermio's career as a prophet. And God says, uh, Before I even created you in this in your mother's womb, I already knew you. And I already made you special and set you aside as holy before you were even born, before you left your mother's womb. I have already made you a prophet to the nations of the world. So then, and Yermio answers, and I said, Aha, Adonai Elohim. Whoa, oh, oh boy, God. I don't even know how to speak. I'm just a young man. I'm not mature enough to to be a prophet to the nations like so th that that's those are the that's the beginning of the book of jeremiah how it starts it's a beautiful start but but you might want to think that wait a minute um it says over here but he didn't do all that perfection yet god is saying i made you a prophet you weren't even you weren't even conceived yet and you were already a prophet right so so um so, so, so for this is the state of every prophet. He must have a natural preparedness. I'm, I'm back in the Rambam now. In his original natural disposition, that shall be explained, right? So, so the, 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 um, the, 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 it is true that God knew that he had the potential, right? Every prophet had to have the potential to become a prophet, right? And that's all that God was saying, right? I knew before you were born, I knew when you were conceived that you could become a prophet. That you had the potential necessary to be a prophet, that you could be Jeremiah of fame, right, and importance in world history. And then when he answers back and he says, "I am a naar, I am a child," right, he doesn't mean that he's just a young boy and hasn't went through the work. Rama said, "Get that out of your mind." He doesn't mean, "Oh, I'm just a young kid. How, how are you making me a prophet that I'm a kid?" It's not referring to that. And Rama was going to say, uh, uh, he's going to prove, and I'll read it, but just he's going to prove in the next like six uh, sentences. That Na'ar has, in this context, has nothing to do with the person's age, right? But rather, um, uh, because you know, in the Hebrew language, Yosef was called a Na'ar, even though he was 30 years old when it happened. When he, right? Yoshua was called a Na'ar, even though he was 60 years old. And then he proves that Yoshua was 60 years old because Moshe was 81. And, and I'm kind of running through some sentences. His whole life lasted 120 years. And Yeshua lived for 14 years after Moshe died. So, 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 uh, so, so accordingly, it was clear that he was at least 57 years old and he was still being called a Na'ar, right? So, uh, so don't, so the word Na'ar doesn't mean, it, it means that Yermio is saying, I feel immature. I feel like young. I feel like I'm not up to the task. I'm not worthy of the task of being a prophet to the nation. That's all it means. It has nothing to do with, um, with, uh, that. So now, um, so now Ramam is gonna, then going to go ahead. So, so, so in other words, when uh, the bottom line is when God says to Yermiyahu that I knew you from childhood, I knew you from before you were conceived, it means I knew your potential. I knew what you could be. 
And then Yirmiyahu responds by saying, well, yeah, but I don't, I'm still a nar. I don't think I'm, I, maybe I have the potential, but I'm not yet there, right? And then God says to him, no, no, you're there. You're there. This is your mission. Go do it, right? So, um, and that's how you have to understand that conversation. But then the, he brings another Pasuk from Yoel, right? Uh, I'm going to read that from Yoel. Give me a second. Um, in the third chapter of Yoel, the book of Joel, right? Um, so, so there it's talking about the, 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 the day in the future, right? One day, right? When God's, God's spirit will, um, will, will, will be revealed to the entire world. So the verse says in Yol, the third chapter of Yol, the first verse, will be after that, I will pour out my spirit, I'll call Basar, on all of uh, all flesh, on all living beings. And your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your elderly will dream dreams. And your young uh, ones will also see visions. Even on servants and maidservants, by Yamimahema in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and so on. And then the famous a verse from the we say from Yoel, but we say it on Pesach night every year at the Seder. And so on. So that's a little famous uh, for those just the thing. So a little attachment to Pesach, which is getting closer. It's not that far away. But anyway, so so what is um, so so for so what does it mean when it says your sons and daughters? That seems like the, these young people are going to prophesy. They haven't yet went through the process, right? That seems to contradict what I just said. It seems like God is going to pour His Spirit out, and everyone's going to be saying prophecies all over the place, even children, even you know, so on. <clears throat> so then He says, for He says, because for He interprets this and lets us know what kind of prophecies. And Yoel, the prophet, tells us what He's talking about. <clears throat> he's not talking. <clears throat> But when he says the next verse, which I just read to you, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. Everyone who communicates knowledge as to something secret. Because, because the word nevua, remember the principle the Ramam said, you have to look at the word in its context. The word nevua, a navi that speaks wisdom, doesn't always mean prophecy. The word nevua could mean speaking out secrets, speaking out knowledge, speaking out visions, ideas, right? Um, uh, for everyone who communicates knowledge as to something secret. Whether this be the help of soothsaying, even if it's not true, it could sometimes be called a nevua, right? Whether it's because through soothsaying and divination, which is obviously not necessarily true, or the help of a ridicule dream, which I had no idea what it was. But the Hebrew a translation that I use, uh, the kapach, translated as chazon emet, meaning a true dream. Sometimes we fall asleep, we dream things that are real, right? It's like what's called a prophet. That's why the prophets of Baal and Asher are called prophets. You know, even, even prophets of the of the, um, the idols, are they saying the truth? Of course not. But we call them prophets because they're speaking out these visions, they're speaking out this wisdom, which may or may not be wise, right? But we still call it prophecy. So all Yoel is saying is, is that everyone in this day in the future, everyone is going to be speaking words of wisdom, speaking words of, 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 of uh, revealing secrets to each other, revealing ideas, concepts, and so on. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's actual prophecy. That's that's how he's understanding that 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 passage we just read together in Yoel. Um, do you not see that he may be exalted? Said if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, right? Um, uh, that that uh, where, where remember Cholem Chalamot. That that's talking about a person who thinks and then goes off the path and denies God, right? Right. It's still so so the same. So the dreamer of dreams is not necessarily a, 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 a saying the truth, but. As for the gathering at Mount Sinai, and this is going to segue into the next chapter, which we're not going to get to tonight, but just a little segue, right? Before he talks about the prophecy of a prophet, he's going to talk about the prof the prophecy, so to speak, that we all had, right? Which was the our vision at Sinai, the vision at Sinai. So as for the gathering at Mount Sinai, though through a miracle, all the people saw the great fire and heard the frightening and terrifying voices. We all saw the terrifying sound of God speaking, so to speak. Right. Um, uh, only those who were fit for it achieved the rank of prophecy. Not all of us actually heard prophecy at that time. Right. Um, uh, do you not see that he says, "Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadav and Aviu, and seventy elders." Um, uh, it, it divides them out because, the, as 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 the uh, as the Mechilta says that he's about to quote, 
Moshe came, and in one one in one category, in one category, and then Aaron came, right, and heard on a little bit lesser of a category, and then not of an Aviu came, and then the seventy elders came, and then of course among the all the population there was also these levels. So people, depending on the level at which they had achieved to hear prophecy, that's the level at which they experienced the revelation at Sinai. I, I kind of paraphrased the last thing to the end of the paragraph. So um, now Rama was going to say, now I just got a little bit carried away with this. So since as we have come to speak of the gathering at Sinai, I'll give indications in this separate chapter, which is the next one, concerning what becomes clear regarding that gathering as it was from the scriptural text if they are well examined and from the dicta of the sages. I'm going to talk to you. We're going to go through the psukim and figure out how our Sinai work and with the, the verses meaning. And we're also going to go through the different dictum of the Chazal uh, and, and, and understand what happened at Sinai. So the next week, uh, Amir Tosham will study together the um, uh, how Ramam understands Sinai. So so just to really quick, just to really quickly summarize, right? The first idea that a prophet could be anybody uh, what Rambam rejected. The second idea that that prophecy is a scientific phenomenon that anyone can achieve, and if you achieve it, then you're a prophet. We, he rejected that idea, and then he said, no, prophecy is something that you have to be worthy of, and then God has to speak to you. <laughs> so that's, I guess, the quickest and easiest way to sum up ch- uh, the third way, which is the Torah way, and um, and we'll talk about it more uh, and then that great prophecy that we all had at Sinai, how that worked and what happened, we'll talk about next in chapter 33. Any questions, comments on anything we studied today, whether about Shabbos, which was really beautiful, or about prophecy so far, um, floor is open. And if, uh, if nobody has anything to say, we can uh, call it for, off for next week. But I'm, I'm thank you very much for... For joining, I'll um, I'll uh, you know, it's next week at the same time. Go so go ahead. No, all right. Well, have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll get together again next week for chapter thirty-three. Thank all you. Right, thank you. Thank Sarah. you. Thank you very much.